to the Institute. Welcome to the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reductions Friday Forum uh, for January 13th, 2023. I'm your host, ICLR Chief Engineer, Dr. Keith Porter. This is one in a monthly webinar series hosted by ICLR. We are Canada's leading uh, source for disaster resilience knowledge. Each month, we present recently completed research or other work related to ICLR's mission to make Canada more disaster resilient. Our last Friday forum, forum brought you Professor Catherine Potvin, uh, who gave us a sort of climate 101 lecture. Uh, I was particularly impressed when she disabused us of some myths surrounding climate mitigation, like how planting trees does not do what we think it does. This month, we have two Friday fora. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Laura Zizzo of uh, um, uh, Climate Impact will talk about climate disclosure information. Uh, but today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Hussam Mahmoud, who's going to tell us about a new mathematical model of wildfire damage at the community scale, considering both the wildland and the urban parts of the wildland urban interface. I'm particularly excited about today's talk because engineers like me rely heavily on models like this to help communities make scientifically defensible risk management decisions. Professor Hussam Mahmoud of Colorado State University at Fort Collins, Colorado. He's a structural engineer. He focuses on sustainable and resilient infrastructure and communities uh, under earthquakes, fires, and other extreme events. He has degrees from the University of Minnesota and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, before our speaker begins, here's our agenda. Our webinar is going to last 90 minutes. Our speaker will present for about half of that time, then I'll moderate Q&A for the rest of the time. Uh, please feel free to chat your questions into the Q&A box. I'm, I'll try to pose your questions in the order that they appear in the Q&A box. If we have a lot of questions, I may only pose your first question, then I'll move on to others, then I'll circle back to your additional questions. Remember that our webinar is recorded. Uh, ICLR was, is, will post the speaker's slides and a link to the video for today. Um, we'll do that on Monday or so. So if you have colleagues who couldn't attend, uh, let them know. And with that, I will uh, uh, turn the talk over to uh, uh, Professor Mahmoud. Take it away, Hussam. Thank you so much, Keith, for the nice introduction and uh, for the invitation to share some of this uh, work that we've been doing at CSU on uh, understanding vulnerability, uh, communities' vulnerabilities to wildfires. Uh, we started this work about seven years ago and we've been at it for a while. Um, we, so we don't claim to be completely done, but uh, we have something I think that might be of interest um, to policymakers and engineers and so on. Well, we hope so. Um, so thanks again for the invitation. So. I will start by maybe uh, uh, give a brief outline of the presentation. So uh, I have some motivations, which you know many of us already know that wildfire is a big problem everywhere. Um, and then I'll discuss the vulnerability models that we uh, developed and how we're using the vulnerability model to determine damage, the potential for damage, um, and then how we can communicate risk using a model similar to what we developed. And maybe I'll provide some concluding remarks and maybe discuss some future work and how the model could be used, for example, in general. And of course, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. Um, so the motivation for the work is, um, in generally speaking, is twofold. So we need to understand losses and we need to figure out a way how we can calculate losses. And, um, the importance of calculating losses is essentially tells you how you can actually prevent them. If you can, if you know how to determine losses, then maybe you can work the problem backwards and, and prevent the losses. And if I want to communicate risk, then I have to be able to do probabilistic analysis to understand what the risk looks like um, from one community to another. Uh, there has been a lot of money spent on mitigating wildfire uh, across the country. Uh, well, across the U.S. and Canada and many other countries for that matter. Um, in the U.S., the U.D. expenditures exceed $1 billion. And obviously, they're not very effective. Despite all the spending, we still have major issues. Um, wildfires are part of nature. They're inevitable. 
will happen, though important uh, in terms of uh, um, ecological cycles for the wildland and the forest and and uh, and species that actually thrive on the wildland. And we need to understand how to manage risk and manage vulnerability better for communities. Um, so it's almost like an optimization problem. We need to figure out how we can allow these fires to occur without actually putting communities uh, in danger. There has been uh, obvious increase in frequency and intensity in wildfire events. And uh, more and more people are living at the interface between communities and, and wildlands. It's an attractive area to live where people like nature. Um, every community has a specific characteristics and it's obvious that the one size fits all solution is not probably the most optimal in terms of cost. Uh, while it actually might be effective if you implement it on everyone within your community, but it not, might not be the most optimal. Um, we don't understand what works better than what uh, for different communities and for different conditions. So we need to develop tools that allows us to understand the fire behavior in extreme events and its impact on communities. And this will help us develop effective fire mitigation strategies. Um, and in order for us to do this, we have to develop models that allows us to actually look at the problem at a community scale, as opposed to just the individual isolated structure scale. Um, so there has been really a good amount of work done at a community level where people have looked at using computational fluid dynamics to model fire behavior in communities. But these CFD models are wonderful, but they're computationally very expensive. So what you've seen, what you would see out there in the literature is that some studies have used CFD analysis to look perhaps at, let's say, handful of uh, structures and maybe a couple of vegetations, five buildings or five homes or 10 homes at max. And if you run the analysis like this, uh, because it's computationally very demanding, you're not really able to do probabilistic analysis. You can just, you know, probably take you about what, two months or so, or two, if not more, to run just one single simulation. So it's not effective for communicating risk, and it's not effective for um, um, running probabilistic analysis or even making decisions on the spot in case there's an event that is coming, then how do you actually... Um, understand what might happen. They're not too efficient. They're wonderful tools, but not too efficient. So what we try to do here is to figure out a way to develop a model that allows us to do this analysis quickly and have a high or relatively high level of accuracy in terms of um, in terms of being able to um, understand the vulnerability and risk. So um, for vulnerability, we developed two different models, one for wildland propagation and one for the community propagation. And uh, I'll show you some analysis results today. In some cases, we want to couple them. In some other cases, actually, we might not, depending on what we're trying to do. Um, so, But I wanted to show you the complete picture first, uh, instead of just showing you one and not the other. Um, usually, of course, the stages for wildfire um, in general, propagation it starts with ignition somewhere, then you have the propagation in the wild land. And that propagation in the wild land might result in embers being generated from or firebrands from burning the vegetations that will fly in the air and land on your homes. That would be called ember attack, for example. Or maybe the, the fire will continue to progress um, and um, um, to conviction or, or direct flame contact between the fire coming from vegetations onto the first set of homes at the, at the boundary of the community. And then, of course, once you start to ignite uh, randomly with the fire brands randomly uh, landing inside the community or the flame uh, or the fire front moving forward with direct flame contact or radiation, then, of course, the problem becomes more complicated. So we started by developing a cellular automata model that allows us to understand or predict how fire might propagate in the wildland. So what you see here is a grid showing um, a plan view of a wildland. I mean, maybe that, that, that would be the green cells and then the blue cells would be the water. Maybe it's a lake or something. And this is just a schematic. Um, and so we give different colors to the cells with the color 
we label one indicates a certain file intensity that keeps on increasing until it's red. That's the color three. And then it goes down when it's being uh, um, um, going off until it reaches a value of zero where there's no fire anymore. And through some uh, rules using cellular automata, we're able to determine the probability of ignition of a specific cell given, given the stage of the neighboring cell or what is the neighboring cell is doing. Um, and the setup of this equation is such that, of course, if I'm trying to figure out the probability of the middle cell, which is what we call here AIJ, comma J, um, if everything around it is at fire intensity level three, uh, which is red, then the probability would be one for that particular middle cell. And I don't want to bore you with the details of, of the other details of how we train the cellular automata and the rules that we have, but I will just point out the features that we have in this model. It considers different burning rates of vegetations. It captures the effect of wind speed and direction. It considers different effect of topography and considers ember generation and flight patterns. So all of these are considered within our model. And the way we do this, because the topography is very important in terms of the spread of the fire over time, we actually develop a 3D map of the vegetation vegetation area or the wildland area. And we include that uh, topography, the slope of the land and so on into the fire propagation, but then we present it on a 2D map so it's easier to see. And a 2D map would look something like this. On the left-hand side, again, it's just an example to kind of orient you with the model that we developed for the wildland. You see a CA map, cellular automata map, showing propagation of the wildfire on the left. And on the right, it's tracking ember generation and trajectory because ember generation and trajectory is a function of the vegetation you're burning and the trajectory and where it lands it's a function of wind speed and wind direction. So in our model, we can vary wind speed and wind direction and see how that changes the motion and the direction of the embers and where they might wanna land in the wild land as well as the community. So I'll just um, run it one more time so you can see uh, again, you can see the ember spotting even on the left-hand side with the with the fire propagation within the community. We've actually validated this fire propagation model. Then, once the fire propagates in the wildland, what happens within the community? And if you look in the literature, you'll find that there's a lot of models that have been developed for fire propagation in the wildland. And a lot we're not the only ones who did that actually. Um, there are many other models, but inside the community, the problem is much more. Uh, complicated. And so if you look at a community, for example, this is uh, part of Fort Collins where I live. Um, and um, the community is very complicated, much more complicated than a wild land. You have ignitable and non-ignitable objects within the community. And that causes this continuous propagation within the built environment. Um, that graph model that we wanted to develop, it considers external propagation between ignitable nodes. Um, and therefore we use graph theory uh, to model propagation within the built environment. So what you can see on the right hand side here is three buildings that we took out. This is just to show what the nodes are that, that identify or represent these buildings. And the links between these nodes, which represent essentially uh, what we call um, the links between nodes in a graph. So these nodes would be the nodes that are making up the graph along with the lens, which is connects the buildings to each other. And I will elaborate on this a little bit uh, in the next slide to make it more simplified. And obviously presenting every building with all these nodes that represent the corners of a building is too complicated. And actually computationally is a little bit demanding. Um, you could look at it in a simplified way by looking at a community uh, now that includes homes and vegetations. And these homes and vegetations can be represented with the nodes that you see on the top right-hand side. So these nodes, uh, the blue nodes represents nodes of homes and the green nodes uh, that you see represents nodes of vegetations and they're all connected with links. And in order for us to determine the probability of the fire transmitting from one node to another, we call that a PTR, probability of the fire transferring. And that PTR um, essentially includes uh, modes of heat transfer 
that include conviction, radiation, and impulse spotting. And you know, conviction that would be the direct flame contact, um, uh, radiation, and impulse spotting. So our job is to try to figure out what is the value for the PTR for each one of these links that we have between the vegetation and the home, the home and the vegetation, and the home and a home, right? With all these links. Um, and instead of actually representing every home with a um, many nodes that represent each corner of the home, because that's uh, uh, that's one way to do it. You can actually simplify it and present the home with one single node. But I'll show you the models that we developed initially with every single home uh, represented with many nodes, because that might become important in some cases. So now imagine you have our wildland model running, and it comes. Uh, uh, the wildfire is coming near the community. So what you can see here at the corner of this box, the green box, you can see different colors. These different colors represents the fire intensity from the cellular automata model that I showed you initially. And this fire intensity vary in, in level. So it goes from red being the highest to black being no, no fire, right? And my community is uh, surrounded by all these different fire fronts, hypothetically. Um, then what happens is that you have internal nodes that represents structures or objects within your area. This could be structures, could be trees, it could be a combination. And so the red nodes is what we call boundary nodes. And let's say the blue node is the one that I'm really interested in understanding its level of vulnerability. And so the first thing we do is we identify the boundary nodes, we identify the node of interest, and then we identify other ignitable objects uh, within my community. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to determine uh, the weights for all these links that connects all these boundary nodes and, and my objects could be structures or vegetations and my structure of interest, which is the blue one. And once I create my graph, I have to determine what is the most probable path from one of the boundary nodes that has a specific probability of ignition because of that um, black and red and yellow lines next to the node, to the node of interest. And you can see that there are many different paths that I could draw, but some of them are most probable and there are most probable path algorithms out there that we uh, looked into uh, to be able to identify the most important or probable path that I need to use in my analysis. And once I identify the most probable path, and I have the ability to, to specify that PTR between these different links, which is the probability of transferring the heat based on the different modes of heat transfer, then I can do that for each boundary node and sum around for each boundary node to get the total probability of igniting this blue node in the middle. So that's in general how, um, how it works. The PTR that I mentioned, which is the value that we have to put in these links or the weights, actually, comes from the probability of ignition due to convection and radiation and impulse spotting. And of course, conduction here in the sense that um, there's different ways you can think of conduction, but once a building receives fire, we assume that the building is on fire. There is no fire transfer within the structure. There is, of course, but because they're wood buildings, they're very vulnerable. We assume once a building gets ignited, it's, it's done. And, and, that, and you observe that in, uh, in, in actual cases. Um, the conviction model, I'm just gonna go very briefly over some of these models because they could you know, be of interest to, to, uh, to some people. So the conviction model is based on distance between the nodes, the effect of window direction is included, the flame height is included and the flame angle is included. And um, the ember model includes the effect of window direction the volume of the node being burned, that could be a tree or it could be a large tree or a small tree, but that volume is important because it tells me how much ember will be generated. The distance between the nodes or uh, the source for my ember and where it might land, the wind velocity is also very important. And you can see on the left hand side here, we can draw an ember distribution for different um, volume of ember we're burning and for different volumes or, or sorry, for different uh, wind. Uh, speed. And the radiation model, we use the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is gives you the how much heat would be radiated from one surface to another based on different factors, including the area, the view factor, the emissivity, and the temperature. 
and the interaction between each possible source target surface bear is evaluated. This Stefan Boltzmann law is very known for uh, radiation model. It's uh, very well uh, um, validated scientifically and so on. And it's developed um, many years ago to look at the impact of radiation from one surface to another. What we did with this model, um, we in, in, included uh, some sort of um, an independent view factor that allows us to actually look at how much radiation you get from one surface. Like for example, you would see a side of a house that might actually radiate heat on two surfaces. So you can see the orange lines in the slide that, that show you one surface is actually emitting heat on two surfaces. And the top surface of the bottom house is actually emitting, this is the side, uh, again, this is a plain view, but it's the, the top side in the slide, is emitting on also two surfaces. And how much heat gets emitted is actually a function of the orientation of these homes relative to each other, which becomes very important for radiation, um, as well as um, other, um, other things related to the material, um, the, um, the surfaces, and so on. Uh, but if you structure it this way, you can take the Stefan Boltzmann law and end up creating a radiation matrix that tells you how much heat is being actually radiated from one house onto the other, which is actually a very cool way to use that model. Um, and interestingly, if you take the transpose of that matrix, you end up getting um, the opposite matrix where you um, essentially have the amount of uh, heat radiated from the top home onto the bottom one, which is also actually very interesting. We modeled veg vegetations, two different vegetations we looked into. The first one was the vegetation that we modeled in the wild land. And um, of course, it's very important to include. It has noticeable impact on, on the behavior in general and the vulnerability in general. Um, vegetation was included in the form of additional nodes. Um, so we have a vegetation uh, uh, file, uh, raster file, and it's broken into grids, and these grids um, uh, allows us to sample uh, sort of few nodes within each grid system, and um, we essentially put it in the model as a, as represented by nodes. Um, the characteristics derived from, from the files that we have, and these are available online actually, um, is vegetation type, flame health, and bit depth and fuel volume uh, for these different vegetations. Um, and, and this allows us to do that for a very, very large uh, footprint of a wild land. So we can actually have a nice representation of vegetation in the wild land. Um, there's also vegetation next to homes. And these vegetation are very important to usually refer to as defensible space. And the defensible space uh, characteristics is, is also another important uh, variable in determining vulnerability. And we define it um, as the vegetation found within the, uh, within the built environment. And each structure, for each structural node, the amount of vegetation is evaluated within that about 50 meter defensible space. And we allow that um, a, a normalized vegetation score is calculated for each structural node to update the ignition potential. So instead of modeling the vegetation around the structure as additional nodes, we actually modify the PTR that I was showing you earlier to reflect ignition potential due to the surrounding the, the vegetation immediately surrounding the structure. And with that in mind, then we started to think about the problem from different perspective. You can actually run the model and get a vulnerability analysis. You can run the model to get the extent of the burn area in the wild land and then in the community and then calculate vulnerability or calculate uh, maybe um, um, damage level, damage states perhaps. But one way we wanted to think about this is to look at it from a, what we call a relative vulnerability uh, perspective. So the relative vulnerability is something that we calculate for each node. Um, and essentially what we wanna see is um, how much is a specific home vulnerable relative to other surrounding homes? And homes with higher relative vulnerabilities are obviously expected to have lower chances of survival and structures with um, low vulnerability will have higher chances of survival. 
And that relative vulnerability essentially of building nodes evaluated as the cumulative impact of all its surrounding neighbors, assuming they have been ignited. And we have a lot of variations of these that I don't want to bore you with, but this is just generally the idea. So we look at damage assessment uh, using that relative vulnerability, but also look at that, looking at something what we call survival curve. So what I show you on the top here is the relative vulnerability distribution. It's an example that tells me um, the relative vulnerability values in my model. I can plot it on a distribution that allows me to show what is the total building number in that relative vulnerability value that my model calculated and how many buildings within that low earth of vulnerability have been destroyed in reality and how many buildings have been uh, have survived in reality as well and of course a distribution like this shows you that the total building that represented in, in in the total building for example that were unignited in that low vulnerability value in my model were actually in reality uh, um uh, actually, not, a, not, not, not too many buildings, and that the building destroyed within that were also not too many buildings. So you can look at it actually and figure out what distribution, of course, uh, um, a distribution uh, in which uh, a skewed distribution to the to the left probably is the one you would want to go after. Um, we also look at survival likelihood, which is essentially that survival ratio, the curve that you see at the bottom here tells you the number of unignited buildings in reality that belong to this vulnerability class in my model. So if my model tells me that there is 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 uh, vulnerability value, and there is a certain number of buildings that belong to this uh, low vulnerability um, range, how many of them survive? And of course, you would expect that more vulnerability, uh, sorry, more buildings have survived in reality. Um, if they belong to this low vulnerability um, range within my model. So if my model says these buildings are low vulnerability, then they better have survived in reality. In other words, it's good to have a curve that monotonically decreases from a large value at low vulnerability range all the way to a very small survival ratio at a high vulnerability range. And if the model is able to capture that or do that, that means the model is working or doing something right. Um, and so I'm going to show you a couple results that we recently uh, determined it hasn't been published yet, um, or at least how we uh, switched it. Uh, the Marshall file hasn't been published, and, and we did something to look at the damage. But what you can see at the top left here is the campfire map, and we're not showing the nodes for the vegetations because it would kind of overwhelm. It will not make it uh, look good graphically, right? So. The red nodes represents destroyed buildings in the campfire. And the green nodes represents uh, survived buildings in the campfire. What you can see on the very right hand side is the relative vulnerability calculations that could go from zero to one. We just plotted it from 0.55 to one. But you can see that destroyed building, the red areas, uh, correspond well with the yellow or reddish area in my relative vulnerability map. And the blue area in which survived also correspond well with my bluish area in my relative vulnerability map, which is actually very promising. We figured out a way to take the relative vulnerability map and turn that into a zero one, meaning damage versus not, not, not damaged. And that's what you see in the middle picture here of red being damaged again, blues undamaged. And if you compare that middle map at the top with the map on the left, which is reality, you would see that, of course, it's not perfect one-to-one -one match, but there is really good correlation. Our model is able to identify vulnerable areas versus safer areas. Um, what you can see also on the bottom left here is the distribution of the total buildings for each vulnerability class that, we've, that we included. The total buildings, the number of buildings destroyed in every class, and the number of unignited buildings in every class. And the survival ratio uh, for this particular campfire shows a monotonically decreasing, um, excuse me, a monotonically decreasing curve that it, 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 after 0.4 to 0.5, it doesn't seem to, um, all buildings seem to have 
similar vulnerability value actually uh, for the campfire. But generally speaking, it's monotonically decreasing, which is great because it tells me that the model is doing something right. It's telling me that the model says these buildings that are, are in low vulnerability, in reality, they survived. And the one in high vulnerability in my model, in reality, they were damaged, which is wonderful. Um, this is the comparison in uh, the glass fire 2020. And again, it's not a perfect match. And I, I would be shocked if we get a perfect match, but we actually have a very, very nice uh, correlation of survived versus damaged building from our model versus what happened in reality. And the survival curve looks very nice in the sense that it's monotonically decreasing. The model says that buildings that my model calculated to be in low vulnerability class actually survived in reality. And the model calculated uh, high vulnerability for certain buildings that in reality were destroyed. So that's wonderful. Uh, again, um, representation of what you would want to see uh, from an analysis results. Um, and we finally did this for uh, the Marshall Fire. We haven't published the Marshall Fire yet, uh, but again, similar, uh, similar um, observations, very, very nice match. And it actually the model beautifully is able to identify high vulnerability areas versus low vulnerability area. If I zoom a little bit on the Marshall Fire uh, zone, so it can kind of show you a little bit of a zoom in. Again, you have the observed versus damage, uh, uh, observed versus calculated damage. But if you look at the bottom row of pictures here, uh, I'm zooming in on certain neighborhoods or certain areas within the community. And you can see, for example, the correlation is really, really good between damage and observed uh, for the different areas we're zooming in on. Again, it's not perfect. And I do not expect it to be being perfect because of the uncertainties uh, in the analysis. But the model is doing something that is very promising. Uh, just looking at the blue comparison of blue and red in the top row of pictures versus the bottom row of pictures, for example. Um, now, there is a lot more to the model that I could not obviously describe because of the you know the details too much too many details. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to kind of you know, present also uh, quickly is what can you do with modeling approaches like this and how can we start to look at a problem from a different perspective? So um, I will just mention before I talk about communicating risk is that in the case of the Campbell fire, the glass fire and the Marshall fire, we didn't have to run the wild land, the model, because we already know the boundary of the fire. So I already know my boundary. I know the area of interest. I ran my relative vulnerability analysis directly on it. But in some cases, you might not have the boundary and you might be interested in determining the boundary. So you need to run the model in a way that gives you the fire progression in the wildland and then how it progresses in the community so you can determine the boundary and then calculate your risk somehow. So to do that, we look at uh, ignition maps. There are maps out there that have been uh, produced and published by many organizations. They're called, sometimes they're called ignition or danger maps or risk maps. Uh, but all they really mainly uh, represent is ignition, ignition uh, potential uh, because they're uh, mainly based on historical data that said an ignition happened in this area. And so if you take that ignition map, which is definitely not risk, it shouldn't be communicated as risk nor vulnerability for that matter. It's just an ignition probability. And you take that ignition and you run the wild land model to determine how big the fire will, will be in the wild land and whether it will get inside the community or not. And then you run the graph vulnerability model. You can essentially determine the risk at a given uh, time. Um, uh, um, and that time could be, for example, your day, depending on the, how we'll find the data, or even an hour, if you have windy data that is uh, updated uh, very frequently, for example. And so if you kind of um, have a convolution of all these things together, you end up with something like this. We took the danger maps, and apologize for the small writing, but I'll explain. So we have the ignition probability that we obtained from, from these danger maps that we calculated ourselves. And we have the community of vulnerability using our graph model. So essentially, we calculated ignition probability and community vulnerability for 
the year 2007, 2012, and 2017 for the month of May until the month of September. And so you can see the ignition probability changes by the day and changes by the month and it changes by the year. And the community vulnerability changes by the day, by the month, and by the year because it's a function of wind speed and wind direction and so on. Um, and that value of community vulnerability, of course, changes depending on the community you're looking at. So it's not the same for every community. So this is an example of Steamboat uh, Springs in Colorado and Jackson, Wyoming. We just want to turn it on these two different communities. And you can see the values for ignition are not the same. You can see the values for the vulnerabilities are not the same, which is what you would expect. But then you put them on top of each other. And now we have a map where you have something that represents risk. And this risk is actually a value that varies again by the day by the month and by the year. And when you start to look at risk in this way, you can start to identify patterns um, and you can start to identify uh, certain days or certain months that might be problematic or certain regions that might be problematic and start to employ mitigation strategies that are tailored to specific communities, tailored to specific time of the year, maybe even if you want to talk about firefighting, you know, when would it be more important than, uh, than, than other and so on. And um, in the process of look, looking at risk this way, you might actually be able to even work the problem backwards and say, now that I know what the risk looks like, how can I reduce it? Which buildings will need to be hardened uh, more than others in order for me to reduce risk at a specific day or specific time? There was a lot more to the to the to the model than what I um, uh, explained today, but just to, to, to sum it up, we can use this model to determine the vulnerability of individual structures and identify critical areas of concern. We've developed a, a, a separate graph model. That was the first work that we've done in 2018 that allows us to determine the um, size of the fire. So again, in the camp, glass and Marshall, I didn't have to do that uh, because I already know the sizes of the impacted area but I can run my model to figure out how big the boundary, uh, the fire boundary would be, and then use that recent model that we just published in 2022, uh, a couple of months ago, to determine the relative vulnerability. Um, predicting survivability is key for determining the most effective policies. And, um, oh, of course, also, you know, from an insurance perspective, you cannot uh, uh, price risk if you don't know which buildings will be damaged versus survived. Risk varies by the day and the month and the mitigation strategies and allocation of resources should also consider this variation. The model we developed, it's exciting because we can uh, use it to determine the most effective uh, strategies um, uh, and determine which buildings will need to be hardened. I, I did not mention, but we're working on this. We're finding out that, um, um, this is very similar to disease transmission in the social network. Certain buildings, if you harden them, uh, they will be incredibly beneficial for lowering the risk for the entire communities. Other buildings are not that important. I'm not saying we shouldn't harden them, but if we're short on money, then maybe we shouldn't harden them because they're not the most important. Um, we're finding also this to be uh, uh, dependent on the wind speed and the wind direction. Uh, and so it's 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 very exciting because it clearly points out to the idea that not a one size fits all solution uh, um, is um, the way to go. And we can actually determine optimal firefighting strategies using this model as well. And we recently actually started to work on progressing this model or or developing this model forward to model fire uh, progression over time. The model that I presented. The wild land is time dependent, but the community vulnerability and relative vulnerability and so on is a static model, not time dependent. Uh, we've ran some analysis on the Campbell fire and we're able to get actually the fire propagation over time to match relatively well with what happened in reality. So that's very exciting development that we're, uh, that we're concluding as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I want to thank you so much for again, for the kind invitation to present to this world and share it with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hussam. This is great talk. Um, very grateful. We have uh, one technical question, um, and and I've got a, a, a less technical one, uh, uh, but I'll start with uh, the technical question from 
Daniel Gorham, who asks, for your radiation model, what assumptions do you make about a T sub F and T sub A? Um, let me, so let me go back to the slides so that everybody is, is, uh, is on the same page. Yeah, okay. So uh, the, the temperature that we, we assume uh, for T sub F and T sub A is essentially um, I guess, again, it depends on the day, but we, we download temperature data that comes from um, um, sort of uh, uh, NOAA uh, data on the temperature at a given community. Uh, what we had to do, I mean, the, the communities we dealt with was um, had a, temp, you know, had a, when the incidents happened, had a relatively temperature that was um, roughly between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't uh, anything more than that. The, 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 the T sub F is, is a temperature that we assume is a peak temperature, depending on the peak tem temperature the surface would observe um, ultimately um, um, at the time of, uh, <clears throat> of for example, of assuming that the radiation is fully uh, imposed from one surface to another. And I forgot the exact temperature that we used for that, but uh, we didn't make uh, we didn't make any um, any um, assumptions that uh, that fell outside of the temperature seated with each surface and the surface temperature related to the color of the surface and how much that would be in order for us to uh, achieve a specific uh, level of radiation. For the building, uh, the, for the building um, uh, construction in the U.S., and we did this, for example, for the Marshall Fire, because the Camp Fire, the data was readily available from Cal Fire. But for the Marshall Fire, we went into because it's not too many buildings, relatively, I should say, it's only two thousand buildings, and and eleven hundred were damaged. We went on Google uh, because we didn't have access to the community, and we looked at every single uh, house, pretty much. And looked at the different surfaces. The, um, we had to guess the material because, but it's not a difficult guess uh, because it's just typical construction and uh, the color of the, the siding colors and the siding number of windows, number of doors, and so on. All of these would have to go into the model as well, uh, which are not included here. Let me ask my question, and I'll turn to a couple that more that just popped up. Um, Hussam, in Canada, the National Research Council has just produced a new design guide called the National Guide for Wildland Urban Interface Fires, and it's and it's similar though it's not exactly the same as the International Code Council's uh, International Wildland Urban Interface Code. Uh, it's similar, but not exactly the same as the California Building Code Chapter Seven A. Anyway, it has a lot of provisions um, about uh, what you can build, especially the cladding um, talks about non-combustible uh, materials for exterior walls and roofing materials and metal screens and so on, as well as uh, vegetation management. By the way, uh, in Canada, the term is uh, ignition zone means the same thing as defensible space in the United States. Just different terminology means the same thing. Anyway, uh, and it this this uh, uh, this uh, guide uh, tells us about ancillary structures like fences and decks and so on. And these little details really matter to uh, homeowners. Um, mm -hmm. We like our wood decks. We like our barbecues and our gardens. Uh, and some of our houses are fueled by propane that's stored in tanks on our lots and can be within a few feet of the house. Um, so when ICLR uh, has helped uh, a community to consider adopting aspects of the National Rui Guide, um, uh, aspects like the cladding, the decks, and the vegetation, and so on, um, th that can produce big uh, arguments within the community. Um, yep. People are saying, you know, I, I, the propane tank is there. Are you telling me that I have to move my, you know, remove the propane tank? I like barbecuing. I like gardening, etc. cetera. Uh, so these big points of contention, yeah. um, they can produce, you know, big questions like, you know, can you prove to me that making some big sacrifice about my way of life uh, is worth it? Significantly increases uh, my safety or the safety of my neighbors and so on. So my question for you is, can your relative vulnerability model uh, help us with discussions about those features? Can it 
uh, help me uh, quantify why I should tell somebody to move or remove their propane tank or that they should buy a metal fence to replace the wooden one mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you know, how much is buying that non-combustible cladding worth relative mm -hmm. to uh, vinyl siding? Yeah, this is a great question. So the answer to this question is absolutely. The model I tried to, spoke about uh, the probability of uh, the PTR values that would have to go into these links, and this depend on again, you know, radiation is one, embers, and and so on, um, and all these values are now not to a great detail because I'll explain why in a second. But a, a very large aspect of what you mentioned, Keith, is included in the model in that probability, and we give the different practices. So, for example, if you have certain type of roof material, then the model includes that with a different probability uh, than, you know, a roof material that uh, might be uh, easily ignitable, for example. And so that the different levels of mitigations, whether you harden by painting a fire resistant material, you know, for the paint of your structure or have a roof material that would not be ignited or the deck, uh, wood deck that would not, you know, catch on fire, for example, or, or a metal fence, all of that can be included in the model. That, that, the thing that makes it relatively uh, interesting from a policy perspective is that the model clearly shows that a mitigation that a homeowner would do would have an impact on the survivability of obviously your immediate neighbor. Yeah. Um, for many reasons, if it's not direct flame contact or radiation, it could simply be the embers generated from a specific home and how that would actually might also fly and land on other homes and start to ignite other homes. So the, the model can definitely include um, all these features, uh, but also show how your relative vulnerability changes from one home to another, but the number of homes that would be damaged in the community, how that changes because you decided to implement um, fire mitigation strategy. So it's it's twofold. It's helping yourself, but also help everybody else in the community. And in some cases, as I mentioned, it's actually not that important because some homes are not necessarily posing their location within the community. It's not posing threat to the rest of the community. So uh, the model can include these features. Um, it was relatively surprising, and I'll tell you, not super surprising, but I'll explain uh, the, the extent to, it, uh, uh, to which this was surprising, but um, that we've received that very high level of accuracy, um, despite the fact, for example, that we don't, we did not have the fences because we don't have the data. We don't have which house has a fence or not. Uh, but to some extent, of course, it depends on it depends on the community we're dealing with. The fence could become irrelevant hypothetically if two homes are very close to each other and you will be ignited because of radiation or because of the fence. So radiation will take over in this model. At high wind speed, embers become dominating. Um, and whether you have a metal fence or a wooden fence, it becomes, again, it becomes irrelevant. If you don't have proper management of the wildland and you have a lot of embers and high wind speed, then, uh, then it, certain things doesn't become relevant. But we're hoping to improve the model by adding other features and things like that, that would be included in the model, but also allows insurance companies to price that level of mitigations that are implemented by homeowners. Thanks. Uh, Scott Davis offers this comment. Um, well, having operational experience and planning for responding to uh, and recovering from wildfires, I'm seeing a whole new perspective from this presentation that's been very enlightening. Thank you for sharing your, your research and knowledge. Wow, it says. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Scott. Uh, an anonymous attendee uh, asks, could information about the facade details of the structures, awnings, decks, siding, et cetera, potentially improve this kind of modeling? I, we've sort of been talking about that, but do you have yeah. any other thoughts about that question? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, we, it could be included. Again, from a radiation model perspective, uh, a model like, you know, um, uh, information about the facades and siding would um, could be included because essentially the model works based on uh, it's a semi-physics, but we need data on different facades and different sidings and different material and so on. And if we have 
a very large database, uh, then we're, we're much able to run it on on different uh, structures and different construction types. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, actually, I'm kind of interested in probing a little bit uh, deeper on that, uh, but I'll come back to it. Let me just make a note. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Kytus Kafali, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Kytus, uh, is the calculated damage destroyed versus end damage for the fires you have analyzed, the, the ones you've shown today, is it a deterministic variable or is it a random variable? Do you generate uh, or simulate one sample from your model to compare to observe damage? Uh, mm, thanks, thanks for the question. No, it's a random variable. So we've entertained actually running an so we've run 10,000 simulations and 1,000 simulations and a variation in between. And we found that 1,000 simulation is sufficient to converge on a vulnerability value that doesn't change when you run 10,000, for example, versus 1,000. And then once we have that vulnerability map based on probabilistic analysis, then we turn it into zeros and ones versus damage versus undamaged. Um Okay, so let me come back to this drill down question. Um, now, I was I was typing my question, and I may have missed you uh, answering it during your presentation. So, if you did, I apologize. Sure. Um, but the uh, the the you sort of alluded you didn't sort of you alluded a moment ago to needing the you have to have data to understand how uh, different material affects the ignition probability. Um, tell us about your you know, tell us about your data sources. How do you know? I mean, do you have empirical an empirical data set that says, um, you know, fiber cement cladding? Here's the effect on uh, ignition uh, uh, cedar roofing versus you know asphalt shingle yeah. roofing. Here's the effect. Tell us about that that uh, those sources. Yeah. So there was a company called Technoselva, um, and they've been doing wildfire analysis for a while. And our recent paper that we published about a month and a half ago, we collaborated with them. They had this data. They had data on the vegetation, they had data on the buildings, um, and they had data on um, um, the, the, the probability of ignition of a certain material versus the other material. And so we took the values for, and I don't remember, you know, all the different type of materials that were included in the database, but we took that and turned that into a relative score because that's what we needed for um, for our models. That allows us to say, you know, this is the worst type of material you would have. This is the best type of material you would have. And if you run the analysis um, using the, the, um, the data set, we ended up getting really good, really, really good results. That, by the way, that data that they gave us was for... The, the, the relative uh, or the probability of ignition for these different type of materials came from um, came from this particular uh, uh, company uh, and was in relation to the campfire. We ran it on the glass fire because material isn't that much different from one community to another. And we ran it on the Marshall fire, which is again, typical building construction. And we got this really good, um, Match of results. So, of course, if we were talking about urban fire, and one of the comments that were made, you know, maybe maybe alludes to this. If we're talking about you know ten story reinforced concrete building, uh, then we need that type of. I mean, if we're talking about you know uh, um, some sort of fire in large urban area, uh, not in a residential community, then we need that type of material or the material used because it would be most likely it would be very different than a typical uh, residential home construction. Uh, but I know you've, you've, you've dabbled into this in the past, Keith, I know that, but uh, this model can perfectly be used for fire following earthquakes, for example, you know, in downtown San Francisco. We just need um, probable representation of the building material um, if we are to look at that, you know, large urban regions. What, what about the sort of the finer features of the building, uh, whether you've got enclosed eaves or not? I mean, that's not a material issue. It's whether you've, you know, uh, what happens to the gases that rise up underneath the eaves? 
does, does your model, do you get at that level of detail? No, we don't get to that level of detail. And one of the things, of course, and I don't know if we'll ever get to that level of details, one of the things that we will trying to do, there's two things that we wanted to do with this, is that can, can we predict the damage? And to what extent is damage prediction um, is actually, um, how accurate you have to be? I mean, uh, right. if, if in, in my case, if I'm 70% accurate and I'm capturing the patterns relatively well, yeah. that's sufficient to make decisions on policies to say, you know what, this area is much more risky than this area. Let's try to hold in this area before we look at this area and so on, as opposed to, uh, you know, what we do in structural engineering and we try to get the stresses and strain to match, you know, yeah, 5% yeah. match. Um, so, um, so, but, you know, of course you can, one of the things I thought about quite a bit is to couple this model with a computational food dynamic model that if needed, mm -hmm. right? and if we say, oh, the accuracy of 70% is not sufficient, then you can actually run the analysis in this model, then take input into the CFD model, bring it back into the graph model to kind of update some of the numbers and the values for more accurate uh, CFD simulations, for example. I think it's needed uh, for decision-making at that point. Yeah, and I, I, I was thinking about how a computer model as useful and powerful as you know, as this one or as any computer model can be, it's there to inform a decision. It isn't there to, you know, to prove everything about the, you know, the decision to, to prove that you must enclose the eaves because the model says so. I mean, there has to be some sort of merger of computer modeling and yeah. uh, firefighter technical expertise where they, where the firefighter says, you know, we know that hot gases accumulate underneath the eaves and you don't want that to happen. So Sorry. regardless of what um, uh, some computer model says, let's enclose the eaves, stuff like that. So there has to be some sort of merger of, uh, of, of judgment and, uh, and computer models to make important code decisions. Do you, do you agree? Do you have other thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I 100% I, I, I agree. And again, this is a function of the community you're looking at. And so for example, and, and the conditions you're looking at. So for example, if we are very concerned about a high wind condition in which, uh, for example, homes will generate their own embers when they catch on fire and embers will also come from the wild land, then it's very important to make sure that we're not burning, for example, the roof material of a home because that will be you know, the ember that would land on other homes. And in such cases, then maybe in that case uh, becomes important. But if we're talking about slow moving fires, home are very close to each other, wind is low and radiation is the most dominant, uh, uh, you know, or direct the flame, it might not be as relevant in this case, uh, but it will depend on the condition. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and, 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 and this is because certain uh, features of a home, including material or configuration and so on, are more important for certain mechanisms versus the other. So we found that in the Marshall fire, was a combination of radiation and embers that were the most dominating. But in some other cases, like the campfire, there was a, actually a good amount of radiation as well, but it was predominantly embers. So you have to, uh, and the models can tell us that. So we have to figure out what are the most important things that we should be doing um, to lower the risk um, in, in these cases, for example, uh, in this case versus that case. Thanks. Um... A couple of uh, uh, a comment and a question. Daniel Gorham uh, confirms the recent paper published by Techno Silva is integrated graph measures reveal survival likelihood for buildings in wildfire events, and he provides the digital object identifier. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, do you mention fire resistant paint or did I get that wrong? How would I find this kind of paint? Um no, it, it's actually right. Uh, there's fire resistant paint, paints that uh, can be used to harden your structure, you know, be used on the sides of the structures. I've never purchased one, but I remember very well looking at, at it online and there was a lot of possibilities uh, that you can find. I don't know if Home Depot would, uh, in the US would have any, but uh, um, there's, there's actually uh, many uh, vendors out there that provide that. 
Yeah, and you might, uh, the anonymous attendee might Google intumescent paint. Um, is that that fire resistant paint? Um, let's see. Um, tell us about, um, does your model handle transmission through uh, grass fires? I mean, the, the village of Lytton, that fire was mostly, you know, that, that was transmitted up into the buildings through the grass as opposed to through the right. ember. Can you tell us about how your model, does your model handle that sort of transmission? Right, that's part of the vegetation layers uh, that we have with, with, with the model. Also the, you know, the Marshall fire um, it was predominantly, well, well, to some good extent, it was also the grass, you know, catching fire. And, and uh, the model includes different types of vegetations that are classified as 100 plus 100, you know, I think 180 different classifications. The, the grass is one of them uh, mm -hmm. that is included to, to, to determine um, that the extent to which um, the, you know, the, the fire boundary might look like, and also if there is ember going to be generated from the different type of vegetations, it's also included, which is a function of many things, the vegetation type, height, volume, uh, moisture content, and so on. And so on. Thanks. Uh, Daniel uh, offers another uh, reference. He says, consider exterior application of fire retardant coatings, um, general developed for interior, generally developed for interior applications. And he provides a link to uh, some work by our colleagues at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home uh, Safety. And that you can, um, you can see that in the um, uh, in the Q and A box. Um, let's see. So we don't have other questions, but you know these uh, your your model could be potentially very useful for understanding uh, the need for uh, uh, fire resistant construction, both in the wildland urban interface and maybe even just buildings in general, right? I mean, the the Marshall Fire was hardly at a place that you would call the wildland urban interface. the the uh, the fire, uh, came in from what's essentially a grass field. It's not like a forest. Right, uh, exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't even know if uh, if the, the the community would have been, do you know if it would have been classified as WUI under the international WUI code? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know if they'd be classified because vegetation inside the community was very limited, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if they would be classified, but we, we we the reason why we looked at the communities we looked is because of the different level of vegetations within within them. But the but you're right, the model in general can be used to look at the potential for fire spread in any community. Um, and and as more of um, North America gets exposed to, you know, longer fire weather, you know, more days above thirty degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, Per year, and uh, you know, vegetation becomes drier and whatnot. Uh, it seems like our need to manage our fire risk just is just going to, at least in big parts of North America, is just going to go up. And we may need to start thinking about uh, adopting provisions like what's in the uh, California Building Code Chapter Seven A or the National WUI Guide outside of the WUI. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the, uh, your model, it's, you know, you, you don't have a climate model in there, but it's kind of one of the inputs you put in the temperature and you put in other aspects that, uh, that, that climate, climate can tell us about, and we can perhaps get a better handle on uh, how our codes ought to be evolving in light of the changing uh, future weather. Yeah, you have any that, thoughts about that? That's, that's a perfect comment. In fact, we, looked a little bit into how this could be used um, considering how the climate might change in the future. Um, the, the, there's literature out there that suggests that wind speed is not going to actually increase too much uh, because of climate change. And actually some, some, some papers published out there that indicate a drop in the wind speed. In fact, historically, there has been a little bit of a drop, uh, but assuming a linear increase over time, that increase is not is not um, is not too high, for example, to say that we'll have 
a different pattern in terms of damage in the community. But it's high enough that might actually impact um, um, evacuation and evacuation policies, because now we're talking about a community that is burning real time, hopefully not, and then having to evacuate everybody uh, on time. And if, if, if the fire is progressing and instead of three hours, now it's gonna actually uh, consume the community in one hour, um, then we have to be very careful with this. The other thing is related to comment you made that becomes relevant and important, but we were not able, we didn't find, found some people talking about it, but there's not enough research yet, is that part of doing this type of analysis is to look at how the vegetation also might change over time. And there's some discussions on different type of vegetations. They call it vegetation migration uh, because they're changing their pattern, they're changing where they want to be located as a function of climate change. And there's no, there's no sufficient models out there that might give us an indication of how the vegetation landscape will be different you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now. But something like that, the vegetation landscape and the type of vegetation, how that might change over time, um, coupled with how the wind speed and direction will change over time can definitely be used to say, okay, we predict the following uh, in the future. We did some analysis with the wind speed and we coupled that with urban growth um, to see then what the size of the problem would be, you know, as time progresses. But yeah, this would be a very important thing to look at. Can you tell us about... Um... Uh, the reception of your model by uh, the fire profession, by the you know forestry profession, by planners. Um, I mean, yeah, I can tell you there is very very strong interest, uh, stronger than what I expected. There is, uh, we get a good number of emails and phone calls, people asking about the model, and I think it's because. When we published this paper for the first time in 2018, we showed kind of the graph model and how it would work in general. Um, but we didn't really, at the time, had progressed enough to say, okay, now we're gonna show how it actually can predict or how it actually matches with the reality. But the recent work we've done and, 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 and that recent paper that we published attracted a lot of attention. So uh, there is a very strong interest from, um, from the Western Fire Association in the US. Uh, there is a strong interest from uh, philanthropies um, and there's strong interest also from insurance companies. I got a few emails from different insurance companies asking about the model um, and so on, yeah. Have you, uh, have you sort of stopped at the engineering, the analysis, the sort of the, the, uh, uh, the computational aspects of this or are you um taking up the advocacy angle of uh of of, of, of of fire resistance are you using your model in any way to you know to argue that communities should do something like adopt the um uh international wildland urban interface code that's a great question Keith. so you know we started this work um say seven years ago, uh, the first couple of years, there was an interest, um, you know, it was part of the NIST center, but then after two years, I think the NIST, I mean, NIST had a lot of money to spend, but- uh, the, Sorry, because we have a Canadian audience here, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Yes. Uh, and yep. CSU Fort Collins was a center of excellence uh, yes. sponsored by NIST. On, on community resilience planning. But there's a lot of stuff to work on. I mean, there's a huge interest in tornadoes and flood, of course, is really important in the US and hurricanes and so on. So um, the wildfire didn't necessarily get the similar level of funding to continue the work. So we continued this on our own. That, and what I'm trying to say is that we've done this work um, kind of, it, it, which is not a good thing, but in a silo so far, right? Uh, we haven't done it. We have not done the work with a bigger organizations that kind of try to connect us with policymakers and so on. There's a paper that we're finishing up that clearly shows the importance of uh, this model in terms of making decisions on how many buildings you should harden within your community mm -hmm. and what would be the payback when you're holding these buildings. We're showing, for example, that depending on the wind speed and depending on the community, the three communities I discussed, um, 
the percentage of buildings that you would hold in, in your community uh, will have an impact on how many buildings you saved. So it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. I cannot say I'm saving 20% or oh, sorry, I'm hardening 20% and that's the 20% I saved. No, in some cases you could harden 20%, but you could actually get 40% uh, saved or, or protected. Mm -hmm. uh, in some other cases, uh, it might not be that good, for example. And so which building should be hardened um, and how they should be hardened? Uh, um, what we call passive versus active, you know, if I want to lump it into two different categories, mm. comes very important. So I'm hoping that uh, we start to push this work in a way that not just says these are, you know, you should be using these building codes or these file codes, but actually even influence these codes to say, here's the most effective way to do it. Um, if you have money to spend and you can do every single thing on every single house, then okay. Uh, but that could be a waste of money in many cases. Uh, but if you don't have enough sufficient funds to spend on every single home in the community, then there's an optimal way to do it so you can maximize the benefit of the number of homes you would save. Um, and the model clearly shows us that with that new analysis that I mentioned. Spoken, spoken by a true structural engineer. Uh, we, we do this optimization stuff all the time. Um, Titus Kafali uh, just offers a comment. Uh, thank you for the great presentation and for the following discussions. Uh, Jeanette Lorenz uh, says, I live in a small town in northern British Columbia. We're surrounded by forests. My house is located at the edge of town at a ravine. Would you be interested in doing a model of my town? <laughs> It depends on the data you have and how big the the town is. It looks like how many how many homes, uh, Jeanette, in your uh, community? Yeah, what's the what's the community, Jeanette? A small town in British Columbia might be actually massive. I don't know. I, I, I'm just kidding, but uh, uh, we we could consider uh, something like that. Actually, we'll running a couple of analysis for a couple of communities now um, at the request also. Um, but I'd love to see what your model says about uh, Lytton, British Columbia, the fire of last uh, summer that burned down that that town. Um, so Jeanette says, not quite sure about the number, but a thousand people. It's called uh, Valmont or Valmont. That's a thousand people. That's pretty small number of homes. Uh, yeah. yeah like 400 homes. Yeah, yeah. that'll be pretty easy to run, yeah. Well, and, and uh, Lytton is about 100 buildings, about 250 residents. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how, uh, I mean, you've, you've already duplicated uh, uh, outcomes in three fires, so. Right. Maybe a fourth one isn't all that, uh, all that useful. Um, well, we don't have other questions, and I don't have other questions, and there's no harm in uh, uh, ending early. So, um, uh, Husam, do you have any concluding remarks you, that you'd like to make? Something that, if we only remember one thing about your talk, it should be this? Uh, well, first, I'll tell Jeanette. Jeanette, you can email me, and I can follow up with you um, and kind of discuss something if, if you're concerned and you want to have a peace of mind or something uh but i'd be happy to talk to you um i just want to thank you keith first for the kind invitation uh and and giving me the opportunity to uh present the model um and of course thanks to everybody who attended and you know just i'll just say you know we're we're pretty excited about the possibilities the model uh we, we still know that we have uh, a lot more to do and a lot more to go but hopefully uh, we can put it in use and hopefully we can um, help influence people's life and save uh, save uh, people and save properties and make life better. I'm hoping that would be a great accomplishment. This was a very exciting talk. Thank you so much. I, I should um, uh, I tell you before I conclude uh, my motivation, part of my motivation in asking you about um, the, the empirical uh, data behind, behind your transmissibility thing is um, that I used uh, CAL FIRE's data about the campfire uh, to develop odds ratios for uh, 
the effect of having various different features on ignition probability. So it sounds like that might have been a, a slightly different approach to the same kind of problem. And maybe we, you and I should, uh, I could, you know, share that work with you and you might get some, some yeah, value. Out of yeah, absolutely. Anyway, uh, Jeanette says that she, she says, thank you. And that she will reach out and uh, give you a call um, or a, an email. But uh, for the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, Usam, I want to thank you for a wonderful talk. And I want to thank our, uh, uh, our, our audience for tuning in once again. Um, uh, don't forget that our uh, next Friday forum is this month um, on January 27th, uh, Laura Zizzo of Climate Impact. Um, watch your email for the advertisement for that. And with that, I will uh, uh, will conclude. Thanks very much for attending, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank bye you. Yourself. Thank you, everybody. Thanks bye, everybody. Yeah, bye, bye.